Presenting today's webinar, Decoding the Walmart Supplier Scorecard, is Tim Carey, owner of Trend Results, a full-service Walmart supplier consulting firm. So without further ado, I am pleased to turn the program over to our presenter. Take it away, Tim. All right, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, today, um, we are going to be concentrating on Walmart, um, decoding what is called the Supplier Performance Scorecard. Um, if you've done business with Walmart, uh, you might have uh, seen this document before. It is um, beyond all of the custom reports that you can create in Retail Link and Walmart's uh, reporting system. Um, this is a, a very common document that buyers and replenishment managers look at um, to assess basically your score um, for their account. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it's considered a same page thinking document because the view that you see on the report is the exact same view that they see. So when you get into line reviews, things like that, um, it, it's good to have not only this report in front of you, but understand what it is. Uh, if you've seen one of these before, it's kind of a hot mess. There's data everywhere. Um, it's the first time you see it, it might be a little bit um, difficult to interpret what it all means, how to, what, what all the data means, so how to see what you're looking for. Um, so we're gonna spend today um, first creating the report, showing you how to create the report, um, and then walking through the main uh, aspects of it, what the goal of it is, um, how to decode whether or not you are doing good or doing bad. Uh, and then uh, when we get into question and answer, I imagine there are gonna be some questions about, okay, this is bad, now what do I do about it? So um, once we get to that part, I, I look forward to answering your questions. <clears throat> Uh, quick housekeeping, um, Walmart makes me say this, we are not associated with Walmart, I'm not training on behalf of Walmart, we are a third party uh, training and consulting uh, firm, so we uh, work with the suppliers as third party analysts, uh, taking over the, the analytics role for them, uh, and we also do these training classes as, as well, um, this, this one we're doing uh, specifically for, for this group, um, but we also have our own uh, webinars and, and classrooms throughout North America, but we are not Part of Walmart, so I've done that part. More housekeeping. Accessing Retail Link, they're very strict about it. Um, it is not a corporate-wide login. If you if your company has one login, uh, that is for a specific user. So if you need more um, more than one login, make sure that each person is using their own login. Uh, I've seen some pretty nightmare scenarios where key uh, violating this rule and eventually their retail closed down. Worked with Walmart before, you probably understand that not having access to retail link can be pretty detrimental to your business. Okay, uh, diving in, I'm, I'm going to move through this uh, fairly quickly as far as report. We're not going to get into a whole lot of detail on decision support. That's way beyond the scope of this. Um, if you've run a decision support report, report before, um, that is exactly where you're going to get the scorecard. Um, so I'm, I've got the, um, uh, and this presentation will be available as, as was mentioned. Um, I, I do have um, a little bit of uh, some notes on here, uh, but this presentation will be available as well. Uh, but it's a simple report to build um, in, in decision support. You'd just be going in decision, uh, in decision support to the supply, the scorecards and summaries folder. And the template you're looking for is a supplier performance scorecard. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you're just going to add a item filter and uh, you, you can, um, you can add just your six digit vendor number, which is going to pull data from all of the items that are associated with that six digit vendor number. Uh, if you're selling into multiple departments, you would use your nine digit vendor number, which includes the department number uh, and your buyer, what's called a sequence number. Uh, that's not a typical scenario, uh, but if you are going into a buyer specific uh, line review, uh, if you're in multiple departments, you need to make sure that your data is isolated to just that buyer's items, or otherwise it's not going to match up with what they have. Um, so just adding your six digit vendor number is going to basically define the pool of data. Uh, as six digits, you're going to see everything regardless of the number of items. That you have even within the same department, it's going to be a global view. If you want to see a scorecard for uh, just a, a certain item or a fine line of items or a category, uh, you can enter that as well. And then you're going to see the data is going to look the same. It's just going to be a smaller pool of data. Uh, so that's the quickest way to do that. Um, if you have questions about running a decision support report, 
Um, we do have some videos on, on online, but um, reach out to me. Um, I've got my email address at the front of this um, uh, this presentation. So feel free to reach out to me after this, um, and I can I can help you walk through uh, walk you through how to exactly do this. Scorecard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Again, this is a same page thinking document. Walmart's looking at your data and your account a little bit different than you might be looking at it. So it is important to, yes, do your own data um, and your own analysis, but also have, um, you know, in the back of your mind, what, what is important to Walmart. And what they do with this scorecard is they're looking at three key performance indicators. Uh, the first is sales volume, pretty straightforward. How much is the consumer purchasing of your items? Um, it makes sense. They want to know how much they're selling to the consumer. Um, what it doesn't do is tell you whether Walmart's making any money on this. So sales is just sales, regardless of it was if it was marked down 80% or if it was a full sale. Um, so the next metric that comes in here is profitability. And this is the one that is familiar to everybody. Uh, how much money and profit is Walmart making? when they sell one of your items. Um, so again, all of this data is from Walmart's perspective. These are sales from Walmart to their consumer, and this is the profit that Walmart's making. Uh, so uh, sometimes you see some pretty obscene markups in here, some 40, 50, 60% markups, uh, which can get a little frustrating when you're getting squeezed in every buyer meeting, but that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Um, but this is going to measure uh, the profitability of that sale, so that tells them I sold this much and we made this much in gross margin when we sold it. So then they can assess whether or not it's even selling this item or worth selling this item. Um, one of the metrics you'll see, and we'll get into the actual uh, metrics a little bit later, uh, maintain margin. Uh, so you'll have uh, metrics like initial margin, which is just your retail price minus cost, Walmart's landed cost, uh, divided by retail. And that just gives you their what you can think of as potential profit. If they sold it to the consumer at the full retail, in other words, no markdowns, that's the profit that they would make, the gross margin. Um, maintain margin takes out any markdowns. So if you were selling at 50% margin in the stores and you had 20% markdowns, their maintain margin is 30%. So that is the margin they actually made when the consumer bought the product. So it is important to think of, in, of from margin in, in, as in, in the, I guess, the realm of what is potential and what was actually realized. Um, asset efficiency is the third one. This one's a little bit more difficult to kind of quantify because there are a lot of metrics that go into asset efficiency. Um, essentially, what they're asking is how efficiently is Walmart handling their assets, which in this uh, instance is your inventory. Um, the, the reason asset efficiency is so important is they've had to purchase this inventory from you. Um, so if they've if they've bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of your inventory and it is sitting on the shelves still one year later, that's not very efficient. Walmart has already paid you, uh, and now it's just taking up real estate. It's not moving through. So asset efficiency um, uses metrics. Um, like inventory turns, um, weeks of supply, in stock percentages, and finally Gemroy, uh, which is gross margin return on inventory investment. Um, we're going to get into all of these soon, but the, the point is the metrics that go into volume give you sales, the metrics that go into profitability give you profitability, the asset efficiency gives you the metrics of how efficiently Walmart is making that hopefully profitable sale. Ideally, they would make a lot of sales at a high margin as efficiently as possible. Uh, getting something into the stores one week, selling it the next week or the next day. Uh, that's, that's a measure of efficiency. Uh, getting in more into volume measures, um, I've got some kind of blown up screenshots here of zoomed in data, but I want to give you, I'm not trying to frighten you here, but I wanted to give you a picture of what the scorecard looks like in general. Um, it is, as you can see, quite a bit of data uh, and quite a bit of data. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, zooming in on the most important metrics. Uh, some of your scorecards will not have populated data on some of these, um, but just to give you a brief rundown, the scorecard is 
up into these column groups. Uh, and these are time groups. Uh, so you've got the first column group, B, C, and D is last week. So it's looking at year over year last week data. Um, the numbers in parentheses here are showing you the data, uh, the time range for that. So it's 2018 uh, week 10 uh, versus 2017 week 10. Uh, the next column group is month to date. Uh, this isn't the last calendar month. This isn't the last Walmart month. This is month to date. So if you're one week into the current month, Walmart month, you're going to see one week of data. Uh, if you're two months, you're, you're two weeks, you're going to see two months of, or two weeks of data. Uh, and the last one is year to date. Uh, this is showing you Walmart's fiscal year to date. If you aren't familiar with that, it is roughly February 1st. Um, so that's the beginning of what they call week one. Uh, I say roughly because it's technically the Saturday before February 1st. Um, kind of confusing, but they refer to everything in terms of week numbers. Uh, I can't get too into the uh, calendar here because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm trying to hit a 40 minute window uh, to, to get into the um, uh, actual Q&A and help, help you guys get some questions answered. Um, beyond that, the time ranges, we've got quarters. So we got quarter one, quarter two, three, and four. Again, these are Walmart quarters, um, which is February, February, March, April is Q1, and then onward and onward. So uh, it's not a physical calendar. It's not January through March. It's February through April is their Q1. And then going down the rows, you'll see some, um, some data under warehouse. Um, if you uh, are not selling product into Walmart DCs, if it's just flowing through the DCs, their distribution centers, you're not going to see any data here because the warehouses never own it. They just are handling it and passing it from your truck through their DCs onto another truck. Uh, so you'll only see data in here if Walmart's distribution centers are receiving the product into their stores, or excuse me, into their distribution centers. Uh, everything beyond that is under stores. You can see under 16, that's under stores. So you've got some sales data, uh, inventory data, all your in stocks, and we'll go over some of these metrics soon. Uh, unit turns, weeks on hand, uh, your ships into the stores, here are your margins, maintain margins, and finally your gem Roy. Um, there is no score or there is no um, uh, row on here called score, even though it's called a scorecard. Uh, if there is a score, it would be this gem Roy, which again is gross margin return on their inventory investment. If you remember back to this previous page, volume, profit, and, and asset efficiency, Gemroy is just these two, volume and profitability. That's your gross margin. That's the top of your equation. Their return on the inventory investment, that's where you get into the cost of the inventory that they have purchased from you. So it's gross margin. How much money and gross margin did Walmart make per dollar of inventory that they had to carry? So you can imagine if the bottom of that equation, if your inventory number is very high, it's going to make your Jim Roy number a lot lower because you're dividing by a bigger. Um, there are some, some disclaimers to that, but um, that's the general thinking behind, um, uh, behind the scorecard and behind what Jim Roy actually is. Uh, so getting into the volume measures, again, these are simply sales to the consumer. Walmart wants to monitor how much um, of your items that the consumers are purchasing. Again, this is your Walmart sales to the consumer, not your sales to Walmart. Um, if you are interested in knowing what your sales are to Walmart, um, they aren't called sales, they're called ships. It's called ships into the stores. In other words, how much have you shipped into the stores? Um, there is no quantity or metric in retail link that shows you supplier sales Walmart doesn't really care about that, unfortunately. They want to know how much they're selling. Um, simply knowing sales does not tell the complete picture. Uh, like I mentioned, you could be selling a lot of product to Walmart, or Walmart could be selling a lot of product to their consumers. But if the whole reason that they're selling it to the consumers is because it's marked down so much, um, because it's perishable product that's about to go out of date, or it's seasonal product that's about to go out of, out of season, um, you know, Walmart's selling it, but in some cases they're actually losing money because of the excessive markdowns. Uh, so it is important to not just look at sales in isolation. Um, the three metrics uh, that cover sales are again, obviously sales. This is all sales. And I've got these defined down here. This is total sales volume year over year, regardless of how long the store has been open. Uh, Walmart has uh, metrics called comp stores. And you 
all retailers have this, but a comp store is a store that's been open more than 13 months. Um, what they're, the, the reason that metric is important is if you were in 500 stores last year and now you, this year you're in 2,000 stores, your sales growth is going to look enormous, but it's just because you have 1,500 more stores. Uh, so comp stores takes out of the equation those stores that were not also selling 13 months ago. Uh, so it is important to make sure you're seeing both of those. Um, so comp store sales, again, is uh, your total sales volume last year. I don't know where my mouse went. There it is. Uh, is your total sales volume year over year of all of your comp stores. And average price, um, this one can get a little murky when you're looking at it across a lot of different price points. But average price is basically the average register price for the sales. And it's just looking at your total sales divided by the POS quantity. Um, the reason that where this can be handy and, and, and useful is if you're looking at a scorecard for one specific item. Remember back here uh, where you could type in your um, six digit vendor number, you could also run the same scorecard for just one item number. In that instance, you would be able to see, oh, the average price is um, the number of dollars divided by the, the quantity, the number of units, would give you the approximate price, the retail price to the consumer when they gave them the money. So if you knew your system re retail price, you could then compare that to, well, it's it's 997 retail price register, but we're selling it for 852. That's an indicative of, of a loss of margin for Walmart. Uh, so it is something that needs to be drilled into a little bit further. Profitability. Um, these are uh, the profitability measures. Again, volume is how much they've sold. Profitability is how much money they made when they sold it. I touched on this a little bit earlier. We've got initial margin, um, which is retail minus cost divided by retail. Think of this again as their potential profit. Uh, markdown percentage is their first uh, reduction in margin uh, at the store level. So sometimes there are corporate markdowns, end of season logic, things like that, but stores have a lot of latitude. Individual stores can mark down um, your inventory um, for almost any reason. It could be uh, customer price protection um, or, or the, the um, uh, CVP customer value uh, plan, which is basically if you see it at another store for cheaper, you can bring in um, either your receipt from purchasing it at Walmart and get the money back, or you can, um, you, know, you can match price basically. So that would be considered a markdown. Um, damaged goods, uh, packaging that was, that was bad, and they, they could maybe sell it uh, at a reduced price um, or, or um, yeah, defective returns. Uh, there are a lot of different codes and reasons for markdowns, um, but that is the first reduction in Walmart's initial margin uh, that impacts their mark, their uh, gross margin and their gym Roy, so they're obviously um, concerned about that. The, um, the one caveat here is that markdowns are not coming out of your pocket as a supplier. Um, theoretically. Markdowns hurt Walmart's bottom line. When you get into a next, in other words, there's no contractual obligation in your supply agreement to say, we're going to give you this, this money back. Whatever you mark it down, uh, we'll compensate you to make up for that. that. That is not a contractual obligation. However, when you get into your next line review, uh, it becomes kind of an informal negotiation. You want to get more items into Walmart, you want to get higher store count, Walmart starts asking for some price protection on, on markdowns um, that might have happened last year or cost concessions uh, um, for your new items that you're trying to introduce. So it is important. Uh, suppliers a lot of times write this off because, hey, we don't have to worry about that. That's, that's Walmart's loss. Eventually, it's going to be your loss. So um, just make sure you're keeping an eye on that as well. If you do see excessive markdowns, do some research, try to figure out what the reasons are. There are all sorts of different reports that you can run that will show you the reason for the markdowns, like what the code is and what the code description. So then you can start saying, well, this is being marked down because of damaged packaging. Um, so we need to look at if it's, if it's our case pack, are, are, are our cases getting damaged and that's what's getting damaged inside is the actual product. Um, so this can give you an indication of there's a problem, then you have to do some more root cause analysis and digging in uh, for the actual, uh, to, to figure out what the root cause is. Uh, we talked about maintain margin earlier. 
there we go. Um, I'm not good with this touchpad, um, so I'm crossing out some things that I'm supposed to be underlining. Maintain margin is the margin remaining after markdowns. Uh, it it is not directly a subtraction. So, like an initial margin here, 43.5 minus 39.61 is not exactly 6.89. Um, what the reason why is they convert these markdowns into cost-based markdowns. Um, the markdowns that you see reported are retail-based. In order for them to say how much margin do we protect, they convert that into a cost basis. Um, we do have a retail math spreadsheet workshop um, that I'll talk about briefly at the end of this um, that, that kind of goes through all of this retail math and helps you play around by making some changes to the spreadsheet and seeing how all of these maintain margins and turns and generally change as a result of that. Asset efficiency. Again, this is a kind of hard one to quantify. It's, it's, it's how efficiently Walmart is handling their assets, which in this instance is your inventory that they purchased. Their, their uh, goal is to sell as much as possible, as high a profit, as efficiently as possible. Their ideal goal is for you to have an employee standing in the, on the Walmart aisles, handing, a, handing a, an item directly to a consumer, and then invoicing Walmart. That's, that's very efficient. It's obviously not practical. Um, so there's a balance between uh, how long Walmart keeps product on the shelves but also having enough inventory for the stores uh, to actually sell so it's available to the consumer. And those are covered right up in, in here, sorry. Um, unit turns and retail turns. Um, if you're familiar with turns, um, it is, it is um, if you're not familiar with turns, it's some, this isn't specific to Walmart. Uh, a turn is a, um, a ratio of sales to average inventory. Um, so you can see that that is a measure of how much inventory we carried and how often we turned that block of inventory over. So if you had a um, uh, hundred dollars in or a hundred units in sales um, in the last year, and you carried on average a um, hundred units, uh, that would be obviously turns of one. If you carried 50 units, that means you had to replenish that inventory twice. So your turns would be two. Um, the general rule with turns is the higher the better. Um, however, there are some disclaimers. You could see if you had low end stocks, meaning insufficient inventory, um, you could see a ratio that seems high because it's sales divided by average inventory. So if you had insufficient inventory, you're actually losing sales, but the bottom of that equation is lower. So you might see say, or unit turns in the four, five, six, um, which is kind of a false positive. So there are multiple metrics that go into asset efficiency. Again, there's that balance between having enough, but not too much. It's like the Goldilocks inventory. Uh, and that's where these two metrics down here come in. Store weeks on hand is the estimated um, number of weeks that, of, of supply that Walmart has in their stores available for the consumer to purchase. This is forecast based. So basically they're looking at, we have X number of units on hand right now. And our forecast is over the next four to six to eight weeks to sell this many units. So we have roughly this many units on hand. That's how long they think the inventory uh, can last. The other one is replenishment in stock. How much inventory does Walmart, what percentage of stores uh, have enough inventory to meet their forecasted demand? So you can see the balance here where, where you get efficiency is Store weeks on hand tells you whether you have too not too much, and in stock tells you whether you have enough. So their balance is is um, between in stock and weeks of supply, or understock and overstock. Um, there are no global targets for weeks of supply. Um, typically, in stock is 98 and above. They they want very very high in stocks uh, so that the consumer can actually purchase the product. Store weeks on hand is a, long, a lot of times it's category dependent. Uh, a lot of times it's seasonal dependent. Um, you obviously need more inventory leading up to an event or to a, a beginning of a season. So in a short term, your, your weeks of supply might look huge, but once you start selling in that maybe summer season, your, your weeks of supply are gonna start to drop. So 
as far as weeks on hand, um, reach out to your buyer or typically replenishment manager and just make sure you're aligned with their targets um, on a seasonal basis. They might say off two weeks of supply during the season, we want six weeks of supply. Uh, so just make sure you're communicating with them. Uh, and finally, the Gemroy, again, this is gross margin return on inventory investment. This is a ratio of gross margin to average inventory at cost. Um, gross margin, again, is sales times your maintained margin, your profitability that they got when the consumer bought the product. So gross margin dollars at the register divided by their average inventory at cost. So if you think about that ratio of sales to inventory, which we saw it turns with sales divided by inventory, gross margin return on inventory investment or Gemroy is just adding that profitability aspect to it. So the same caveats exist, typically the higher the better. You wanna, you wanna be making as much profit per dollar of inventory that Walmart had to invest, but if your in stocks are too low, let's say you have in stocks at 70%, that means you have not enough inventory. The bottom of the Gemroy equation is average inventory. So in that case, you would have a lower or a smaller number in the denominator for Gemroy, which would make your Gemroy numbers appear higher, but you're looking at in stock levels, you know that you're losing sales. Um, so it is important to not look at just Jim Roy on the short bar. The reason there are 50 or 60 different metrics on here uh, is because they all contribute in either a small or a very significant way to the gross margin, uh, to the Jim Roy uh, score. Um, and so I'm gonna go back to that main, oops, this main screenshot real quick. Um, so you can see uh, Jim Roy there, but there are all of these different metrics as well. Uh, I do wanna point out here are your markdown dollars. That's the, remember the first thing that came off of um, uh, the scorecard or off of the initial margin. So you have your potential profit as initial margin, your markdowns, and they show it both in dollars and in percent to sales. Uh, that is uh, the first reduction in your uh, in your um, initial margin or Walmart's potential profit. Your maintained margin, which is 42, that's the one that goes into Walmart's Gemroy calculation. That's the one that they really care about because that's what they actually made, not what they could make. And then as close to maintained margin as possible because that means they had very very little. Uh, um, loss in the in the uh, in the uh, in the realm of markdowns and uh, things like that. Go back here. Okay, we are actually. I'm about ten minutes early here. Um, we can open some questions. Uh, let me just go through this one last thing, and then I guess we can get into some questions. Um, and again, I can answer questions after the fact as well. Um, we do have, uh, like I mentioned, we are a consulting firm and um, uh, we do sales analytics for suppliers as third parties, but we also have um, training classes similar to this, but much more in depth, much longer. Um, one of the newest ones that we have is uh, called Walmart Retail Link Fundamentals. This is a full day class, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and it deals with everything. So if you're new to Walmart, you have your introductory lessons, uh, advanced report building. So beyond just the scorecard, getting into market basket analysis, um, demographics, um, historic uh, metrics like uh, historic sales, historic inventory margins, year over year stuff. Uh, we get into supply chain management, replenishment, forecasting, uh, and even OTIF. So a lot of um, a lot of suppliers uh, are really hurting with all of Walmart's OTIF requirements. Uh, so we included that as part of this as well. Um, we've got both of them an online version, self-paced. So you can uh, uh, get the data or get the presentation and go through it on your own, ask us questions later. Or we also do live uh, webinars and workshop classes as well. Um, guys on this um, webinar that you're attending right now can use this discount code to get 10% off on that. Um, but I have, uh, I think I overshot my mark. I was trying to um, make sure I had enough time to finish. So I was talking a little bit fast. Um, we've got, uh, it's, it's only 1.30 right now. So I'm gonna turn it back over and see if we do have any questions coming in. Um, and uh, if we need to go back and review something, if I was going too fast, then we can certainly do that. 
Thank you very much, Tim, for your presentation sure. and your insights. Um, we will open the Q&A now for, uh, with the questions we've received. Attendees, you're welcome to submit your questions. Again, just go to the control panel, drop open the, uh, the questions box there. It's a drop down, and you're able to type the questions in there, and I'll read them all for you. Uh, Tim, first question I see here is, why is a scorecard called a preset report? Um, that's a good one. Um, preset reports, that, that is coming from someone who uh, has run decision support reports before. Um, in decision support, um, you have a lot of different templates. There are probably three or four dozen different report templates. And by a template, I mean this is, this is where you are going to build a basically a database query. You're saying, I want to get some data from Retail Link, uh, and these are the templates that you use. Uh, depending on the template, you have to make some very granular decisions, like what columns do I want to see? What uh, rows, how many rows of data do I want to see? Do I want to see just the Walmart's item number, or do I want to see the UPC as well? Uh, do I want to see sales, returns, um, inventory, store count? So you're building that report in a very granular way. You can make very, very specific um, uh, decisions when you're building that report, the, which is great from a supplier standpoint. The problem is if you get into a line review, you might have a report that is configured one way. Your buyer's looking at the scorecard. They're looking at, at data in a very preset manner. When you run a scorecard, you'll notice on this page, there are no columns to select. You're not saying, I want to see sales and inventory and store count and in stock. Um, I want to see it for this time range. I want to see it for just these stores and just this item. You're making one selection. What's the pool of data? Do I want to see buy everything under my vendor number or just one uh, set of item numbers or one category department? Um, but the format is going to be the exact same thing that Walmart sees. So preset just means that the format is preset uh, so that you and the buyer are seeing the exact same thing uh, when you get into a line review or start reviewing the document. Thank you very much, Tim. Another question. Mm -hmm. Is there a portion of the scorecard or a separate scorecard that is more related to supplier shipping performance, including OTIF and shipment quality requirements? Uh, there is, I'm going to, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There is a section on the scorecard that I, that I wish they would take off. This has to do with on-time delivery performance, uh, average lead time, order fill rate, on-time request for routing, MABD compliance. I'm begging suppliers do not look at this data. It is way out of date. It's been around for 20 years and it went away when OTIF came about in 2017. So if you need data on OTIF compliance, you're on time in full compliance. You need to dig into what DCs uh, are seeing the either the, the inventory shrink or seeing the late deliveries or early deliveries. Um, that is the OTIF scorecard um, that you're going to need. And, and you can get all the way down to PO details in there. Um, so you can do a lot of really good root cause analysis. Don't make the mistake of, of sending your buyer this screenshot and saying, I don't understand what you're saying. Our, our in stock, our, our requests for routing um, uh, compliance is 100%. When they're looking at the scorecard saying, no, 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 it's more like 60%. Um, so that's where, uh, where you would go as far as shipping performance, on-time delivery, in full delivery is the OTIF scorecard. Uh, for the, there are two scorecards. There's one for the US and there's one for international. So if you're doing business with Canada or Mexico, uh, you need to use the international version. Uh, if you need to um, you look at US data for Walmart US, um, the, uh, it, it's called on-time in full scorecard. So you can go to the apps uh, in Retail Link and just search for on-time in full. You'll see the scorecard there. Uh, that we do walk through that in that that uh, retail link fundamentals workshop. There's a whole video walkthrough of all the different screens, how to drill down, best practices, uh, root cause analysis, what to do if I see this number, where to go from there. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out so I could say uh, get rid of everything row 53 on. You don't need it. Thank you, Tim. Good information. I remind it to attendees, you can submit your questions through the questions box in the control panel. Also, if you would like to be unmuted so that you can speak to Tim directly, you can raise your hand there and I will be able to unmute you. Great. We do have another question though here for you, Tim. What is the value of the scorecard to Walmart? 
Oh, um, the value is um, they're looking at um, basically how successful your account is. Um, you could be head to head with another supplier um, and you're selling very similar items. Um, you're both up for line review and you sell more than they do. You don't know this, but Walmart knows this. Um, you sell more than they do. They're selling at a higher profit or they're selling it more efficiently. Um, Walmart has a higher gemroy with them than they do with you. Um, when it comes to making these business decisions, this is where they're looking at. Because remember, it's not just about sales. It's not just about margin. It's about how efficiently did they make a high margin sale. And that's what Jim Roy uh, ultimately kind of your score here. Um, but it, it's it's all derived from all of this data with the, with uh, are your in stocks good? Are your weeks of supply in line with expectation? Are you selling a lot? Uh, at high margins? Are your markdowns out of control? Um, are you carrying way too much inventory that Walmart is, is having to sit on the shelves and not realize their profitable sale uh, efficiently? So that's what this scorecard um, uh, gives Walmart. And so they're looking at it and they're judging your account, not just to your account, but across different suppliers. So when it comes time to start awarding more real estate on the shelves, to awarding new items, um, to doing promotions, this is the stuff they're looking at, is not just how much you sold. So uh, that's why this is a valuable document to Walmart. Uh, it, it is kind of a first, um, uh, a first, I guess, thing that Walmart suppliers do when they get into Walmart is they look at sales makes sense. How much of our items, how many of our items are Walmart consumers purchasing? Makes sense because Walmart is going to be ordering more from you to fill the shelves. They might not be ordering more from you. If, if they're selling this at a huge discount because their margin or their markdowns are so high, or if the product's sitting there at the end of the, sh uh, at, at the, end of the season and that's why they sold it, um, you know, in that case, it's not a good situation. So this is a weekly report that I like to look at with our suppliers that we do analytics for. Um, it gives me Walmart's perspective, and then you can use other decision support reports to build custom queries to kind of drill down and say, what, what are the issues and how do I resolve them to make sure that the result is a healthy scorecard when you do get into these line reviews or these conversations, phone calls, webinars uh, with, your, with your Walmart home office team. Thank you very much, Tim. And we have five other questions I see right now in the queue, so you're going to have to keep talking for a few more minutes. No problem. Our next question up is, where is this report generated from on Retail Link? Uh, that is, oops, let me get back here. Um, there is an application in Decision Support or in Retail Link called Decision Support, and that's where, as a, if, if you're tasked with getting data from retail link that's where you're going to be spending a lot of time um th this since this was an only an hour long presentation we didn't get into decision support entirely this is the recipe for how you build a decision support template but uh, to get to this section um it is under the apps tab so if you're on the home page in retail link you tab there's a little search bar down there where you can search for decision support new um, and that will take you into the decision support application. And this is the path within decision support to find that report template. Uh, so it's in the, you'll see a lot of folders in the bottom left of the screen um, or, or of, the, of the decision support homepage, scorecards and summaries is there, and you'll see probably a dozen different reports. The one you're looking at is called the supplier performance scorecard. And then the data here is how to run the report, which you'll see tabs at the top, click here, click here, enter this number, go to submit, name the report, run it, and save it. But you're gonna spend a lot of time in decision support. Um, so if you, if you do need a, a, a crash course on that or wanna get into in depth, this, this Retail Link Fundamentals Workshop would be a, a good place to start for sure. Thank you, Tim. And what is the EDI rate? Uh, EDI rate is the, you have success rate. Well, first of all, somebody's breaking my cardinal rule. This is down under row 53. So you're supposed to be disregarding that. Um, EDI pickup rate, this is only for Walmart suppliers who don't do web EDI. If you have your own EDI, um, they have, 
I don't want to get too technical with EDI, but you get a transmission from Walmart's uh, home office, from their EDI system saying, we're going to order this much. Um, you have to send transactions back to them or confirmations back to them in a, in a timely manner. So if your EDI provider is kind of spotty, um, that's going to end up impacting your EDI uh, pickup rate. It's, it's not anything that's really looked at by Walmart. Um, you know, obviously it's in your best interest to have EDI picking up all of your orders at the right time. So um, it is something that, that um, is listed on the scorecard. It's not listed anywhere else in Retail Link. Um, your EDI provider, whoever that is, uh, could probably give you that kind of data, um, but Walmart's not looking at it. They used to when they did all of this stuff here, um, but it's not anything that's um, really relevant to um, to their to your performance um, anymore. Thank you, Tim. And does Walmart use a supplier segmentation program, such as um, strategic versus transactional vendors? And if so, is it represented in any of the scorecards? Say that again, you kind of broke up a little bit. Oh, of course. Does Walmart use a supplier segmentation program, such as uh, strategic versus transactional vendors? And if so, is it represented in any scorecard? Um, segmentation analysis per transactional vendors? Are you talking about like a split supplier program where um, uh, you have multiple suppliers su uh, supplying the same item? I'm, I'm missing out, I think, on part of that question. Um, of course, let me bring up the individual who asked the question. Um, sure. Let's see, Mariah, that's you. If I unmute you, would you provide clarification on your question? You're self-muted right now, but I have unmuted you. Yes, Mariah will be with us in yes, a moment. Yes, hi. Hello. Yes, thank you. Hi, Mariah. Um, so I'm referring more to a segmentation program from a strategic sense. So your vendors that maybe you spend more time with in top to tops or um, things like that versus your transactional vendors that are easy, easily replaceable. So I didn't know if you had anything like that. It's kind of supplier yeah. relationship management. Um, there isn't a, a report that shows that. Um, but that would be a great one. Um, category managers, category advisors do have access to specific to to all suppliers that are in that category. It's it's kind of a fox guarding the hen house thing. A category manager, and you've probably seen communications from your category manager uh, in your Walmart account. That is not a Walmart employee. That is a supplier employee whose job it is to oversee the entire category. Um, they're looking at sales for every supplier in their category. Um, they're looking, they're making modular recommendations. Um, so you do get a little bit of fox guarding the hen house there. Walmart is very unique in that, in that instance where um, they're kind of pushing off some of the workload onto their suppliers. It's usually the, the top producers in the category who, who um, are the category advisors. Um, they aren't seeing profits or, or your costs or anything like that, but they are seeing sales performance in stock markdowns. As far as, <laughs> as, far as who gets rewarded the most and who gets the most face time with Walmart, um, it's typically the the higher dollar, higher profit um, suppliers. Um, I I have um, witnessed and been a part of some very frustrating situations with Walmart, where um, you know you're trying to get their attention about something that is that is out of your control, in stock issues, missing purchase orders, things like that that are, that are about to be impacted by an event or a promotion or a seasonal um, uh, the beginning of a new season. Um, and you're trying to get hold of the buyer, you're trying to get hold of the replenishment manager, and you just can't. Um, a lot of times that just means you're kind of low on the on the totem pole, and, and they're dealing with the PepsiCo's and the and the J&J's um, who have literally offices in Walmart HQ, not in Bentonville, but behind the security doors in Walmart. So I think that's what you're saying. There's no report that, that, uh, that shows that, unfortunately. Let me know if I'm reading the question. No, that's great. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you very much, Mariah, for jumping in and Tim as well. Let me add one thing to that that is, that is um, uh, should be something you could fall back on. Walmart has a, a, a sundown rule, what they call a sundown rule. Um, and it is typically 
they have a rule that if that they are supposed to reply to any communications, email or phone, uh, by the end of the following day. And they say the following day because you know they might get a request at 4:30 Central Time uh, that they just can't get to. So they have basically a kind of a 24-hour rule that they're supposed to be reaching back out. It's kind of a, a, a higher level mandate um, that just doesn't make it down to ground level. Unfortunately, it doesn't doesn't get down to the grassroots where your buyers some are more responsive, uh, some just aren't. Uh, unfortunately. Thank you, Tim, for that additional information. I have one final question in the queue, so if there are any additional questions, we do have about 14 minutes left of this webinar, so please go ahead and add those attendees. Uh, so the final question in queue is, is there an actual score on the scorecard? And I think you touched on that in your presentation, Tim. Yeah, no, there, there isn't anything that just says score, and but Jim Roy, if there is a score on the scorecard, that would be the number. But there's so much that goes into Gemroy with your sales and your profitability and your asset efficiency, all the different asset efficiency measures with unit turns and in stock, weeks of supply, um, costs on hand. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. So there isn't anything that's called score. The general synopsis and, and a kind of a, a understanding between Walmart and suppliers is that Gemroy is the result of all of these other things being successful, selling a lot at a high margin efficiently. Um, all of these different metrics that you see up above, those are ultimately getting down into gross margin return on inventory investment. Um, similar to turns, there's no target for this score. It's not like 100 is better than zero. Uh, it isn't like a grade. Um, just remember this is a ratio, it's a dimensionless number. It's it's the ratio of the gross margin to the average inventory uh, at cost for the year. Um, so you, you can't just look at this number because like we talked about, um, the bottom of that equation is average cost of inventory. Uh, which is one of the, uh, where is it? Your cost of inventory right here. That's how much Walmart has committed to and, and actually physically purchased from you as a supplier. Uh, obviously, they need to be selling that or they're, they're on the hook for $2 million. Um, so Gemroy tells you a ratio of that. But if, let's just say, for instance, you had in stock over here, I'm just going to change this number. Th this isn't real time. So um, it's not going to update the scorecard. Well, let's say you've got 50% in stock. Well, that's going to make your, your, your inventory significantly lower, but mathematically would double your Gemroy. So it would look like you have a better score because it's higher, but you don't. You have to be looking at in stock. You have to be looking at the inventory, your weeks on hand. Um, you know, in this case, you've got 22 weeks on hand. That's not very efficient unless you were at this point point of running this scorecard, you were building up to a season. You know, obviously you're bringing inventory in before the demand kicks in. In that case, you might see these snapshots where you're, where you're, um, uh, where you do see high weeks of supply, but it's kind of a false positive. It's about to go down to two, three weeks of manageable, efficient supply. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the short answer is generally would be your score. It's hard to quantify that. Um, just like your weeks of supply targets, in stock targets, um, unit turns, Jim Roy, uh, reach out to your replenishment manager and buyer. They have their targets in mind. Um, some of them don't share it. I don't know why, um, but just, you know, be in communication. I, I, our suppliers, we send out weekly updates to our, to our buyer, not just with Excel data and attachments, but with key points. Here's, here's in the email, the key points. We have in-stock issues here. We have high um, weeks of supply, forecast inaccuracies, OTIF performance, just bullet pointed down so that they can take it, look at it in the email. If they need more, they can get into the scorecard and get into your all, all your other account summaries and Excel documents. And then they can ask you, you know, their questions. Um, so it is important to maintain, not just once a while, but maintain a, a um, you know, a constant line of communication with your buyer. You might not hear back from them, um, but, at least you have that paper trail where you say, I've been telling you about this for nine weeks that we have purchase orders and forecast inaccuracies and, and we haven't been able to take care of those. So, uh, you know, it's almost a, a um, 
a paper trail where you can diplomatically wave that around during a line review and say, hey, we've been trying to communicate this. We haven't heard anything back, um, but the, here are our recommendations. So um, yeah, I would, I would include this kind of data and also root cause analysis. Uh, we have in-stock issues. It's because our fill rate was a little bit low the last six weeks. Uh, we have more inventory in stock. We're about to, we're now filling orders 100%. We can expect this to be uh, resolved by week 32. Um, so don't just give them, here's a bunch of data, give them the key points, give them the root cause, give them the recommendation um, and, uh, and let them do with that what they will. But I usually would have, at minimum be communicating with your buyer and replenisher manager on a on a Monday morning basis every Monday. Thank you, Tim. And finally, we have an inquiry on when is a full workshop for the scorecard. Uh, for the scorecard, um, I have you can actually see it on. Uh, well, first of all, we have a you can do it on your own. We have um, a portal on our website that's probably. 75 pages long that's all of this everything from supplier onboarding uh, what goes into a six and nine digit vendor number getting started exploring retail link the dashboard running probably two dozen different decision support reports so beyond just the scorecard um, teaches you how to use decision support reports you've never even thought about didn't know existed uh, get into supply chain um, we get into forecast, replenishment and forecasting, and finally OTIF. Um, I can show you real quick. Just on. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Okay. Um, yeah, you can go into this is our website trendresults.com. Uh, the on-demand one is is the workshop I'm talking about. Uh, just click on on-demand, and it will show you um, you know the entire synopsis of what we're going to cover, and you can register right there um, on that. If you wanted to do the classroom, we do the same thing in classroom workshops around the country. We finally started doing that again. Right? Uh, thanks to COVID, we had to. Uh, disband the in-person stuff for a couple of years. So we did start about a month ago getting back into this schedule. Uh, we're in Bentonville, Mississauga, which is Toronto area, uh, whoops, Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, and Illinois. So this is the exact same workshop that you could do on your own um, to, and, and uh, or, or, you know, if you do like the in-person attention, you can do it, uh, do it that way. We haven't started doing this one on a webinar yet because it's, the in-person classroom is seven hours, almost eight hours long. Um, nobody wants to be on a webinar for eight hours. So um, we do these in person. If you don't want to join in person, I would recommend this training, uh, which is self-paced. You have access to this workshop for three months from the day you purchase it. Um, you could get your whole team in there uh, to review it. Um, so that's that would cover, you know, not just the scorecard and creating the scorecard, but all of the the, the uh, uh, different different aspects of it. Okay, thank you very forget, much. And, and yeah, and don't forget, I, I know you're sending out this presentation. Uh, so they'll, on this last uh, screen, you can see you can get uh, a 10% discount on either the in-person or the on-demand or the webinars that we do um, by just, when you go to check out, just use that code and it'll, it'll apply 10% off. Thank you very much, Tim. And I'll be sure to include that in the email that I send out as a wrap up as well. Sure. That will come out later today, probably before the end of the day. Um, so at this point, hearing no additional questions in the queue and knowing that we're coming up on time, we will close out the session. So on behalf of RVCF and Tim Carey of Trend Results, we would like to thank you for attending. A link to the on-demand version of the webinar will be sent to you following this program once the file is available. And if you have any further questions about the material covered today, please feel free to contact Tim at tim at trendresults.com. Thank you all and have a great day. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Tim.